we go. When I first watched this video, I was shocked. Like probably the 22 plus million viewers and counting who have seen it. But I was even more stunned to learn that people were also worried about the shark. While the diver emerged unhurt, social media lit up, concerned with the welfare of the shark. Like most people, growing up, I was afraid of sharks, and all thanks to a movie, Jaws. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution. It lives to kill. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws. Jaws demonized great white sharks by portraying them as vengeful predators, out for human blood. It sparked an unprecedented slaughter of sharks. Since the film's release in 1975, shark populations have declined over 50% worldwide, and in some species, over 90%. This is alarming if you consider that sharks have roamed the Earth for 400 million years. The fear of sharks that has been ingrained in us by the media is what I believe has made us uncaring to their fate. My name is Nico Ibarguen, and I am the environmental correspondent for Fusion. For the past decade, I have been fascinated by this mysterious and majestic creature. So I am traveling to the remote island of Guadalupe in Mexico to finally meet face to face with one of the most feared apex predators in the world, the great white shark. To better understand and demystify this enigmatic predator, I am joined on the expedition to Guadalupe Island by two giants in shark conservation, Rob Stewart and Ocean Ramsey. Rob is an award-winning wildlife filmmaker who directed one of the most influential shark documentaries of all time, Sharkwater. Since its release in 2007, Sharkwater has been credited as the driving force behind the abolition of shark finning in over 80 countries. Ocean Ramsey is a marine biologist and shark behavior specialist. She is famous for free diving with sharks without a cage or protection. She is a shark whisperer. Guadalupe Island is 250 miles off the coast of Ensenada in Baja California, Mexico. From October to February, great white sharks follow the migration of seals and tuna to this remote volcanic island. Yeah, I'm very excited to go to Guadalupe. What can we, I mean, what do we expect to see there? Guadalupe is probably the best place in the world to dive and see great white sharks because the water is crystal clear. You can see for 100 feet. They're there to feed on seals, to socialize maybe. So we'll get to see, you know, the world's most badass shark in its natural environment doing its thing. Should we feel that fear towards white, great white sharks? No, we shouldn't be afraid of great white sharks the way we are. The thing about great white sharks is they represent the sum of many of our primal fears. And what, what you see on Shark Week, what you see on TV, is the 1% of 1% of the time when the great white shark does that. The monster the media is portrayed is a glorified, vilified, amped up version of a great white shark. After an 18-hour crossing, we are officially in Great White Territory. Upon our arrival to Guadalupe, we are joined by one of the world's leading experts in Great White Sharks, <laughs> Dr. Mauricio Hoyos. He has been studying Great Whites in Guadalupe since 2003, where he has been stationed every season since. I've never been to, with a white shark before in my life. And I've been with other sharks. And you know that everyone is so afraid of white sharks. Everyone yeah. thinks that these sharks are just man-killing man machines, exactly. man-eaters, and if a white shark sees you, he's gonna come after you and get you. I mean, people, when they come, 
every time that they come, they are very afraid of, of sharks because they have that image in their brain about Jaws. Actually, some people is like, hey, I can listen. I, I am listening to the music. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you can definitely hear it. <laughs> and after the first day, everything changes because now they are, oh my God, they are so beautiful. They are so majestic. Please tell me what should I do to protect them? Because now they, they were face to face with the real white shark, not with the shark from the movie. So there this is a different is a shark. Can right? you get to see that? But how, how dangerous it will be, for example, to swim with them outside of the cage? I think that everything uh, in nature is about the attitude. If you act like a prey, you are a prey. But if you act like a predator, they, they respect you. So when you see that they come very close to you, you have to swim a little bit towards the shark and then they go away. But if you run away, <laughs> if you swim away, they will go they after will you. Sometimes, sometimes, because in here, since visibility is great, I think that they know that you are not part of the menu. So they respect you, they're like, what is that? Monkey with the bubbles. <laughs> but they, they get curious. I mean, they get close to you, but never. I have been here since 2003, and I haven't been in any dangerous situation with the white checks. I have been in dangerous situations with humans, but not with the white checks, never. Coming up, I come face to face with a great white. Anchored off the coast of Guadalupe, we prepped the cages and chomped the water with bait. It was time for my first intimate experience with great whites. Great White is truly massive. They can grow up to 20 feet and weigh 4,000 pounds. This was definitely not the shark I learned to fear so much in the movies. They were incredibly shy and not the bloodthirsty creatures they are portrayed as. As they got closer to the cage, I was able to lock eyes with them. Contrary to what many believe, their eyes are not black. They have a beautiful blue iris. After my first encounter with great whites, I sat down with Ocean to break down what we had just seen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down shark body language and see how they establish that social hierarchy. So most basic, parallel swimming. Okay. So parallel swimming is you swimming two sharks swimming nose right to next nose to each other. or nose to tail. Okay. They don't have to be at exactly the same level. Sometimes they're higher, and you can see the animals slightly turn to Looking actually at each other. yeah look at each other. Now, it's not always the biggest shark, but generally the biggest shark ends up staying, and you'll see the smaller one drop down and leave. The next one we want to look for, which we actually saw this afternoon, you saw it, right? The gill uh, popping. The gill, the gill popping, yeah. yeah. Why, why is that? Gill popping, I would say, is a light form of irritation. So it's kind of like when we get frustrated, you're sitting in traffic yeah. or someone's just being annoying, whatever it is. What do you do? <sighs> you sigh, right? Yeah. And you say, give that animal some space. And then we've got pectoral dropping. So pectoral dropping, I like to say, is kind of like flexing. They're trying to intimidate each other or intimidate you, whatever it they is. So this. depression of the pectoral fins. Oftentimes you'll see it with arching. So the back will actually arch up. You can imagine two cats coming in to meet each other. If the cats don't like each other, what do they do? Become yeah. like an ant. Yeah. yeah, they arch their backs, exactly. Yeah. So look for that in the white sharks. And, it, and when I say give space, it's very important um, that you don't turn your back to the animal and swim away quickly. Don't quickly give them space. You want to keep eye contact so that they know that you're there. And then move back slowly. And move back slowly. And always with sharks, it's not exactly the animal that's in front of you, it's the other two or three that are behind you. Because okay. depending on the species, on the level of intelligence, they do work together and they try and come in at different times. So okay. I know from diving with white sharks, yeah. they're not malicious, they're just very intelligent predators. While we were in the water today, we witnessed a strange behavior, a shark using its massive jaws to bite a buoy on the propeller of the boat. 
I wanted to understand the reason for this seemingly aggressive behavior. Uh, well, you know what? When these uh, operations started in 2001, 2002, the fishermen became very uh, upset because they said that the sharks were becoming very aggressive. And they thought that it was related with these operations. But I asked them what happened, and they told me, no, no, they always want to bite the engine. And it's because the, the reaction of the metal with salt water creates a galvanic reaction. And they have the ampule of Lorenzini, so they, they are attracted by that. It happened today to us. We were in the boat, and it was trying to get the propeller. But it's because of that. It's not because they want to eat us or the fishermen. It's because of that reaction of the metal with the, with the salt water. So it's not a show, like a show of, of aggression? No, I don't think so. Ah, OK. And also, I mean, sharks, um, they don't have hands. All their sensory systems are on, you know, their nose. And so bumping into a new item, not always biting it, but sometimes bumping things can give them, um, is this a potential food item? So we took a biopsy from this one. So it's going to be interesting to see if they have a high level of mercury, because mercury affects the nervous, nervous system. So it's going to be interesting to, to see the level of mercury in this particular animal. If it is very high, maybe it's because, because of that that she's behaving like this. Wow. Coming up. Lately, we have had a few uh, accidents. Uh, the sharks were hitting the cages, especially in this season, a lot. Okay. Even as Jaws sparked a race to kill sharks for sport and entertainment, the film also helped trigger and fund new research into shark behavior and ecology. So much of what we know today about sharks is thanks to these studies. So this is uh, the spear gun. When the shark is very close to us, we have to shoot at the base of the dorsal fin with this special tip, and it's gonna take a small amount of skin and muscle. Dr. Arjo's team has been recently conducting biopsies on Guadalupe's great white sharks monitoring for any changes in the animal's physiology that would indicate imbalances in the marine ecosystems. Perfect biopsy. Yeah. I mean, oh, how, much, yes. how much does they it hurt them? It's, it's like a mosquito bite, but with this tissue, we are doing a lot of different analysis. We are doing a genetic analysis in order to know if they are related with other sharks from other populations. Yeah. We are doing something that is called stable isotope analysis. With, now, with that, you know if the shark is feeding on seals or tuna or any species of prey. And also, we're doing the contaminants. We want to know if they have contaminants in their tissue. So this is very important for us. We're doing several studies with the same uh, biopsy. There's a lot of products that contain sharks uh, in them, like shark cartilage pills and liver oil that actually you can find in a, in a drugstore in the United States. And they sell these pills as a, as a health supplement. Exactly. That, 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 I mean, what do you think of that? Is, it, it, that, is that healthy? And they're it, selling it as a health product. Yeah, in some cases, they believe that they, it's the cure of cancer because they think that sharks do not get cancer. So sharks do get cancer? They do. People believe that they don't. And so far, I think that they have found 22 species with, with cancer of sharks. There was a male with a big tumor in the left side, very close to the eye. We took a biopsy and we found uh, two different kinds of cancer. So in this case, now we're trying to see if they have contaminants related with plastics. What does the fact that you are finding all these toxins in, from these biopsies uh, tells you about humanity? Well, I think that we have a very negative effect in the, in the oceans. And even though that you are living in a city, you will think that you are not going to affect the oceans, and you are. And this is very bad for us. We have to learn that we are part of, a, of an ecosystem, and we should uh, act such a part of it, and not like some uh, virus that is just uh, depleting all the resources and not thinking about the future. While we have largely had a negative impact on ocean ecosystems, some people on the island of Guadalupe are attempting to encourage shark conservation through ecotourism. I think that shark ecotourism is very good uh, because people change their mind whenever they are face to face with the real sharks. In addition to helping change people's perception of sharks, ecotourism can bring much needed financing into critical conservation programs. Unbelievable, you expect it to be extremely exhilarating, but instead it's like, they're very really majestic. Peaceful. They just kind of slowly come up and they surprise you, obviously, but it's elegant in a sense, rather than like Jaws, where it's really like, raw. it's not like that. 
They're worth more money in the water alive for tourism than they are dead for fins or for other shark products. So tourism is massively important. Sharks have an unlikely ally in the shark tourism industry. However, some conservationists argue that shark tourism changes sharks' natural behavior. People believe that uh, these operations could change the natural behavior of the animals. And also lately we have had a few uh, accidents. Uh, the sharks were hitting the cages, especially in this season, a lot. Now there's a video that was all over the world on the internet about this accident in one of these boats. There we go. Oh. Oh. Why something like that happened? Well, I think that this particular season we have seen a lot of juveniles. And uh, since there's like a hierarchy based in size, if you have two or three sharks in there about the same size, they respect each other. But if you have a juvenile, they are trying to get the bait as soon as possible, if they have a chance. And I think that, that that's what happened. Sharks can't stop and they can't go in reverse. So if a shark's charging in a cage pretty fast because there's a piece of bait right in front of it and it hits just the right spot in the cage, it's gonna go inside. You could see in the video how panicked the shark is and how you yeah. know he immediately like once the the top of the cage is open as soon as he can figure it out. And then as he's jumping out, you can see the blood coming from the gills. Have you seen the shark after that? They saw it that particular day after that. And after that incident, so it was okay. It's, it's refreshing to like see that people are concerned exactly. for the shark, right? Exactly. That was good. Yeah. I thought that it was going to be, oh, the shark wanted to kill those persons, and the diver was going to say, I survived. And no, people is very mad because the shark was injured. So this is good. Coming up, we never anticipated that we would experience exactly the same type of accident that we just had scrutinized. After a week without incidents, and in our last hour, the unthinkable happened. As four sharks were circling the boat, Kurt, one of our camera operators and Ocean, jumped into one of the cages to get some last minute shots. Four sharks all kind of came together and it was beautiful. And I was, I was looking at them this way and I feel the cage jolt. So I look over to my right and um, one of the sharks had its nose in the cage. So you, you were not really concerned about the shark biting you? No, I didn't think at, at any moment the shark was gonna try to bite me. My main concern was to get myself out. Of course. Once I was out and realized I was okay, I was like, okay, man, I hope we can get this shark out of this cage. Your perception about why sharks changed after that incident in any way? Um, no, not at all, actually. Um, I was not worried that the shark was gonna bite me intentionally. It, it all happened kind of so fast, but it felt like it happened, like it felt like it took forever. A part of the reason that we're seeing more incidents is because the smaller sharks, which move a lot faster and feel pressure from the larger individuals that are in the area to race in and race out. And the largest of the individuals took that priority position up by the cage, by the point of interest. And so it was just the size of the animal um, from turning that fast and actually hitting the cage um, that was what, you know, caused the incident. And it was really unfortunate what happened, but I think it, we're extremely fortunate that, you know, no one got hurt. The shark is okay, the shark's healthy, the shark's fine. Um, but we want to do everything that we can to make sure an incident like that never happens. I sat down with Fernando Aguilar, one of the tour operators in Guadalupe, to find out what is being done to avoid these kind of incidents in the future. Se van a tener juntas con todos los operadores y expertos para darle clases a los tripulantes, a las personas que van a estar en el manejo directo. Vamos a rehacer todas las jaulas de todos los operadores a, a un nuevo diseño que sea lo más seguro posible tanto para las personas como para el, para el tiburón. O sea, que no irías con las jaulas que tienes ahora. No. Eso es ya una decisión tomada. Sí, es una decisión tomada. Pero even though Fernando reassured me that changes are being made for the next season, Mauricio has deeper concerns. My main concern is that if the Mexican government decides to shut down 
the ecotourism in Guadalupe, the poachers is could that, come. Is that a possibility? It, it is. It is because if they start to do like an investigation, okay, let's see what happened. What's happening? Maybe we have a lot of sharks, but we have to do some research in order to know what is happening in Guadalupe. If that happened, if they close maybe for a year Guadalupe, and if no one is there taking care of these sharks, I think that the poachers could see that as an advantage and they could kill 10 sharks in one day. It's very easy to get a white shark. So you can just get the shark, remove the jaw and release the body. In, in one day, you can get 10. So if a boat comes and they take, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 animals, it's gonna be very bad for the population. So that would be my main concern. We quickly learned that the practice needs some changes. Better cages, better handling of the bait, and educating the tourists themselves. They are also part of the problem. We really must educate the tourists because sometimes they are the ones pushing the ecotourism operators in order to get the sharks closer. There is no denying that jaws touch something deep in our psyche. Great whites are the ocean's top predators and they deserve respect. But it's a slippery slope between respect and fear. The author of Jaws, Peter Benchley, was deeply perturbed by this. He said, quote, knowing what I know now, I could never write that book today. Sharks don't target human beings, and they certainly don't hold grudges, end quote. Benchley spent much of the rest of his life campaigning for the protection of sharks. It's up to us and the next generation to change the theme song for sharks from one of fear into one of wonder. The biggest fundamental shift that is going to change the world in the right direction is us, instead of focusing on slowing down our ubiquitous patterns of destruction, yeah. deciding as a species that we are not here to be destructive. The Earth should not be a worse place after my life than it was when I was born here.